What's good? I'm Markley Morrison, and this is a special bonus episode of Low Profile from the Ruinous Media Network and KAOS 89.3 in Olympia. Today, I'm speaking with the author, filmmaker, and visual artist, James Spooner. In 2002, James released his first feature-length documentary, Afropunk, which highlighted the experience of black folks in the punk scene. The film sparked a movement of live events, zines, and eventually a festival that James is no longer associated with. And in 2022, he released his first book, a graphic novel called The High Desert. I read it, and I was so blown away that I sought him out as soon as I finished reading. And eventually, we wound up setting up a live interview after a screening of Afropunk at the Capitol Theater here in Olympia. Like myself, James grew up in the Mojave Desert, but he also spent some time living in Seattle. This was his first visit to Olympia, as he explains. Obviously, I'm familiar with a rock star kid, like the whole like sure, legacy yeah. of Olympia, but I just, uh, I was too young to really like come down here, you know? I didn't have a car or anything. Right, yeah. You you living with your mom at that point? No, or... I was like 19, but oh, you know. Oh, gotcha. I never left Capitol Hill, basically. Right. <laughs> Busing, walking, biking, exactly. etc. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm thinking it's pretty remarkable this film is 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were, you were just a kid when you made it pretty much. Like, yeah, I was, yeah. uh, I was 25 uh, when, I think when it came out. At what point did you realize you were making a documentary? Like before it happened? Or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, so basically in the year 2000, I was 23 and I basically had one of my many identity crises around race that I had throughout my life. I think mm-hmm. just being biracial, living amongst white people, it was just they happened every so often. But this particular one, I couldn't shake. So... I decided to go to St. Lucia, where my family's from, try to like get back to my roots or whatever. And upon going there, I realized that like I didn't really have a whole lot in common with them either. Um, I felt like a foreigner and whatever. Right. So, so coming back, I had a lot of anger in me. You know, I was still part of like a white rock and roll scene, and I just felt like like somebody should have said something, you know, like I'd already, I've been vegan since I was 16. I was like, you know, well-versed in feminism. I was like an ally for gay and lesbian community. Like you're putting in the work. I was, I was, a, you know, yeah. like I was preaching these politics, but the conversation around race was usually limited to like Nazi punks fuck off. You know, right? Yeah, which is like great. That's an easy one. You know, like yes, should you be. know, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, but also like, what are we doing on the other days? You know, mm-hmm. and those were the those were the questions that would really affect me. So, I started having conversations with the other kids of color that I was connected to, and seeing if they were kind of feeling those, having those same questions, or how they dealt with them, and. At the time, I was a sculptor, and I just kind of realized, like, I need to make some art around this, and a sculpture just isn't going to do it. Right. So yeah. I just kind of l- l- led with that DIY mentality, the same one that, like, let me start a band or have a record label or put on shows with no experience, mm. which was like, I'm just going to make a movie, you know? So that's, it was, you know, intentional from the beginning. So it seems like there must have been a number of like road trips or just like kind of destination to reach all these people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the first, the first step was uh, I got to get an email address, you know, like I got to get like, it's the year, it's the year 2000, you know, like it's still, it was still being a dial up. Um, I had to get a computer. I had to learn how to like edit, you know, so, and all of this stuff is expensive. So I had to like do it in steps, you know? So I got a computer so that I could like get on the internet. What is this thing? The internet, you know, and like find people, you know, there was no social media. So how do you find people, you know? So you waited till 21st century to get email? Yeah. I didn't have an email till 2001. Wow. So I 
had no use for it. Like, you yeah. know, um, you need to get something, somebody quick, you fax it, right? Like uh-huh. you go to the post office or whatever, like the, yeah, yeah. the copy shop, you fax it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't go to college or anything, so I just never had an app opportunity. Um, so I got a computer. I was like surfing the web, you know, oh, punkplanet.com. Like they have a message board, you know, and I could like go on there and just be like, hey, like name all the black punks you can think of. Like who's the black punk in your town? You know, oh, black Chuck. Oh, I got to find that Chuck, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just started like kind of compiling a list of people trying to reach out, emailing people, like just trying to figure out who would make good protagonists who would be people that would just be interesting to interview. And once I got together enough names, locations, by that point, I had paid off the the computer, I maxed out my credit card again, and I bought a camera. And then I had a benefit show that I raised, I don't know, like a grand or something. So I could rent a car and then go to them. Just you? Uh, Tamar Holly actually went with me. The woman, the one of the, the protagonists, the woman with the shaved head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we met and we just kind of like clicked. She was going through a tough time at the moment. And I was like, I'm about to hit the road. Do you want to come with me? And we just drove around and, you know, spent a month. We interviewed 33 people in 28 days. Wow. Um, but then there's still, there's like 80 people in the film. So throughout the two years that I was editing, I was also interviewing and yeah. popping them in, you know, layer it on. Yeah. Yeah. The more, the merrier. Yeah. Until at one point I was like, all right, I can't do any more. <laughs> you know, like, sure, I gotta, sure. I gotta cut it off at one point. Up to a point. Are you still in touch with the, many of these folks? Yeah. Like, um, Tamar and Mo, the t- two of the protagonists are like some of my closest friends. And a lot of the people who like, I call the chorus, like are people who I, I still, the friends, the people I work with on different, you know, on other projects, like it's the film has fostered a a much larger community that I'm still very connected to. Just in case it's helpful to uh, lay out what you mean by the chorus, I really like your use of that. Oh, just kind of like the the eighty people who are in the film that aren't the four people we keep seeing over and over again, uh-huh. you know, or like <laughs> that we don't see their lives, you know. Yeah, your book, The High Desert. That is, in essence, sort of the prequel. Yeah, it is. I mean, if, you know, a lot of people, uh, I've had the comment that, you know, Afropunk film doesn't have me in it, you know? Right. Like, you only hear my voice one time at the very end when I ask about uh, naming bands. And that was done very purposefully. I, I think at the time, I watched a lot of documentaries, and I didn't like when you would hear voices from behind the camera. You know, so I tried my best to avoid that. But if you know me, the story arc of the, of the film very much is my story, you know? Right. Um, so I am present. And, you know, for uh, any film lovers out there, especially documentarians, like nothing is completely unbiased. You know, the director has a, a, a direction, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, always. But The High Desert is specifically a memoir about my first year finding punk. I lived in a small desert town in Southern California. I was one of two black kids in that, in that little town, same town, apparently that you grew up in. Yeah. uh, Right right down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, which is remarkable. It's like nobody is from there. (laughs) I feel like that region, the high desert in California does kind of, breed strangeness in people Uh Um, it breeds otherness for people who don't feel like they belong yeah i mean it's definitely a place where if you are othered you should really leave (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) because if you don't you're bound for trouble which basically this book uh kind of covers that first year you know the experiences of being black in a town where like Nazis are just very like comfortable being, you know. Yeah, they're just it's they're like chilling. Yeah, I mean, and and when I was in middle school, like kids would just have swastikas written on their like trapper keeper, and like nobody said anything, you mm-hmm. know. So it you know kind of just focuses on like answering the question, what is punk really about? 
you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's very much about me, but I, I found that, you know, the story translates and I think the, the more personal you get, the more it's relatable it is somehow. Definitely. Um, I think everybody can probably find something to, you know, latch on to and, uh, see eye to eye with, but also it's really eye opening to get your unique perspective. I also really like it when books have a soundtrack <laughs> and you did a great job of that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to jump ahead too quick, but you, you, there is a new book on the horizon, black punk now, which you, you're the editor. So it's, it's, you're shaping the story here. With yeah, other I, voices. And, and I, I'm, I, so myself and my co-editor, Chris Terry, who's also a Black punk author, the two of us put together this anthology of Black punk writers and comics creators. And so this book, Black Punk Now, I mean, it's fiction, it's nonfiction, it's like comics, it's horror, it's fantasy, there's interviews. It's really trying to give like a, a, a whole like spectrum of black punk stories told from the perspective of black punk writers. Yeah. And you're using, like you're saying pretty much every print medium possible. Yeah. There's a so script in there. Like there's a, there's we, the script we, was really cool. Thank you. I, yeah. I, I really like that. that one too. Yeah. That was a good inclusion. So no spreadsheets. <laughs> no spreadsheets. Uh, but my, uh, I, I included a comic in it and I also like did all the illustrations. So there's like 60 illustrations in it. Yeah. There was a Olympia reference in the comic too, that you drew. There's a bikini kill oh, lyric yeah. that shows up. Yeah. I have a, uh, my comic is about raising a black punk daughter and, you know, I have all these cells of her being little and these little punk moments where I'm like so proud, like, the one that you reference is when she first learned how to skate, roller skate. She was like five, four, and she on her own was singing uh, Rebel Girl. Girl. Thinks, yeah, she's yeah. the queen of the neighborhood as she's roller skating. You know, it's like a very <laughs> like, oh. Now she's in middle school and black kids are saying like she's whitewashed, you know? So it's like really hoping that this generation doesn't have to deal with the stuff you know, I want to live, I want to live in a world where people are looking at this as like, oh, that's how it was. Yeah, exactly. You know? But unfortunately, 20 years later, people are still saying like, yeah, that's my story too. Yeah. What in the film are you still, you know, I, I, you've seen it a million times. A million times. Um, what's, what's the part that really gets you? Well, I feel like it, you know, I still get a little like misty in the end when they start talking about like why punk is so important to them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Gingy Brown does such a good job. Uh, he was the singer of Absolution. He's the one with the gap in his teeth and he's like among a bunch of keyboard and stuff. And he, yeah. he just does such a good job of like saying, like talking about, you know, kids asking questions. And when kids ask those questions, we need to listen, you know, that that whole section just keeps me uh, like, I still get emotional. You know, I really love the part where uh, Mo from Cypher is like, you know, talking about writing music for black people, but then he's like, surrounded to all by, of these white kids in a bowling yeah. alley. You know? It's like, yeah, you know, those moments are just like, wow, that was like pretty good filmmaking. It's really powerful <laughs> when he's yeah talking about like, I, okay you guys are all singing these words but it's not meant for you yeah. like this is you know it's it's a whole nother ball game yeah but, uh, it's also fun just to be like you know 20 years later and know where these people are have gone and you know like tamar kali is like a very successful um composer she's done soundtracks for our scores for like academy award-winning or nominated films. Mm. Um, Mo is the national director of the Working Families Party, and he's a founding member of Black Lives Matter. You know, so it's like these right. really. It's 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 fun to to see my friends grow up and like apply punk to uh, their adult lives. Yeah, still making big moves. Yeah, 
Um, you know, and I think that that's a message that like now as a 40 something year old punk rocker that I want to be able to say like, yeah, you know, those ideals we had when we were kids, like we can apply them to, to our lives now, you know, even if it's to like open up like a vegan donut shop or whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's just like yeah, these yeah, things yeah. That, that we learned back then that we can still use, you know, it's basically just like, how do I live without screwing people over? And that's kind of like the questions we are asking ourselves when we were 15, listening to crass or something, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you had a punk band at one point yourself. I mean, it's not really worth mentioning, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry then. <laughs> well, I mean, you, but you, you figured out early on that that wasn't the area that you were going to be putting yourself to work in. Yeah. I mean, I think that when I was 14, 15, 16, like I really wanted to be on stage. I really wanted to like, you know, command a crowd. I really wanted to like, I didn't have, I don't know that I had anything to say, but I just wanted to say it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, And like, I mean, I'm like do it. I can play bass, but it's like doing math. It's not it doesn't come natural. It's very like calculated and yeah, you got to work it out yeah. first. Um, and like my voice is terrible, so it's just like that wasn't in the cards for me, you know. Uh huh. Uh, but when I was seventeen, I started a zine, and I start you know I would go to shows and you know sell copies of the zines and patches, and eventually like had a record label and. Um, put on shows and I, I saw that like uh, that was the first time where I felt empowered you know like oh like we're in this space and it's all these kids there's not even any adults here we like put this show together and like really had a language for uh, community and um, you know how to think that economics of it all and the need for cooperation over competition and all of this stuff just like that stuff was set the course for my entire life. So I'm guessing when you, when you had your own merch table, basically you had patches, zines, a label. Is that after you left the desert? Is that when you're in New Yeah, York? I was, I was in the desert until I was, uh, I left when I was just turned 15. So I still had three years of high school left. Yeah. Yeah. So there was none of that. There wasn't even really any shows in the, in the desert. So I didn't know like that a merch table is something that existed. <laughs> this show, I, I love that your book opens in uh, a metal show at a church, yeah. like with a Christian metal band. That's literally the only kind of shows I ever saw growing up there. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely like, uh, you got, you took what you got. You know? Yeah. But everybody showed up for it. Yeah. But, what it looked like in the book. Can you, I, I haven't heard you talk about your label. How, how long did that last? Yeah, Can you like who, good. who was on that? So the biggest release, uh, was the swing kids seven inch, which was like free locust. If anybody knows okay. that band. Um, yeah. I know the locust. So I, you know, I knew the, the pre pre band from that was struggle. Um, who I, was just an incredible hardcore band, very political and really like flipped my brain. And, uh, you know, I wrote them a letter just like 16 years old, like you guys rule, you know, kind of thing. And they wrote me back and it really just became this like, Oh, like these are just people, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. And I ended up like, <laughs> this is like a really funny story. Like the bass player, Justin, who was singer of locust, he was the bass player of Struggle. He just wrote me back and said, uh, thanks, you know, blah, blah, blah. here's a free seven inch, whatever, you know, if you're ever in San Diego, look us up. And I'm telling you three months later or three weeks later, I was on a Greyhound bus to San Diego and I just showed up at his door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, okay. And he just let me in. I stayed at his house for two weeks. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it was just like a punk house with six people in a yeah. bedroom, you know? Oh, that's um, wild. But in that time, it's like I learned, like one of those kids had a record label and, you know, like I kind of just, oh, this is just something you can do. 
Yeah. You know? So, um, what was I, it called? My, so my record, record label was called Kidney Room Records, which was like some vegan reference from, uh, I think it was from Animal Liberation or something. I don't remember. But, um, and uh, so I put out Swing Kids. I put out a band called Frail. Um, another one called Elements of Need, which like, I guess the claim to fame on them was uh, Eric Wareheim, the comedian. Yeah. He was the guitar player in Elements of Need. So. Oh, wow. So there's that connection. Yeah. So, you know, random uh-huh. fun facts, you know. But um, yeah, so I just put out like a few seven inches, you know. Cool. Yeah. His experience. It, it got to a point where it like, it was like big enough where I, would, I needed help. And I was like, do I want to have a business or do I want to be a kid? You know? Uh-huh. So I just was like, I just want to be a kid. So I just gave the rights back to all the bands, like the masters or whatever. Uh-huh. And walked away from it. How did you find uh, tattooing to be a profession? Oh, so I'm a tattooer. Um, that was after Afropunk. I moved to Los Angeles and I kind of like was trying to like make it in Hollywood, you know, and then going to pitch meetings and doing all this bullshit. Yeah. And it just like didn't really vibe with me. So I think in 2008, when the recession hit, all of these, I was working this production job. Everyone got laid off. I was into cycling. And I met this kid at the bike co-op who was a black punk and he knew about Afropunk and he turned out to be a tattooer. So he was like, hey, like I asked him kind of naively, will you teach me to tattoo? And just on the strength of the film, he was like, all right, you know, word, you know, it, it was just that permission that kind of got me in the door. But it's a it's a tough industry to really break into. Not very inviting. Right. You still got a chair someplace? Or? Yeah, yeah. I still tattoo like once a week in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. If anyone's down in LA, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I might have to. I have, I have a pizza that I got like 14 years ago that still doesn't have any toppings. <laughs> and that's it. So <laughs> Put the mushrooms on there for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the first, first goal there. <laughs> um. I spoke with you in one of my classes at Evergreen Mm -hmm. last fall. And at that point, you were talking about um, a follow-up, a novel Mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, prose. Oh, sure. That's further biographical, kind of picking up where the high desert story left off. Yeah, thanks for just letting me pitch everything here, aren't you? I, <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to celebrate the body of work that is James Spooner here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a, a, a book that's tentatively called Name Three Songs, and it is prose mixed with illustrations, and uh, it's coming out in 2025 with Pantheon. So it's like comics, illustrations, flyers, and, and prose, you know, just mm-hmm. general novel writing. Um, the, the actual story is basically my Afropunk story. So it, it starts in my teen years, learning up all of the things that we just talked about, DIY, and like learning these ethics and morals, you know, and then having the experience of having anger uh, in my early 20s, wanting to like really tell these white punks who they are, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, celebrate like, uh, you know, eventually being able to celebrate like the POC punk experience, you know, and making the film. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but Afropunk then became uh, a series of concerts. And then that led to the Afropunk Festival, which was a DIY venture for the first four years. And then uh, there were a number of corporate, um, compromises that had to be made that I couldn't deal with, but those compromises fly right in the face of all the politics, the, all the ethics and yeah. morals that I learned. It smells kind of like Coachella or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it, mm-hmm. you know, and if you know anything about Afropunk today, you Google it, it's, you know, now it's an R and B festival. Um, pretty much, but it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 
100,000 people go to it, you know, it's, it's fine for what it is. Like, I don't have like super strong uh, anger anymore because it's like, I'm, I take it for face value. It's a, a corporate festival that a bunch of black people go to and have a good time. And I can't get mad at that, you know, uh -huh. but uh, you know, the journey for that happening is kind of an interesting one. Um, and then what's even more interesting or the thing that really excites me is the reaction from the underground. So the, the kind of silver lining, happy ending of the, of, of the experience of having like Afropunk capitalized out of away from me, gentrified away from the community that built it. Yeah. Is that so many punk kids, like it's been around the festival has been around for 14, 15 years now. So many punk kids grew up hearing about Afropunk. They went and were so like disillusioned with what it had turned out to be that they went home and made their own festival. Yeah. You know, that's what, and that's what it takes. Yeah. So me realizing that like, Oh, punks are nothing if they're not saying fuck you to something, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so I had to give them something to say fuck you to, you know? And yeah. then in, in return, I got what I wanted, you know? So that's kind of the story arc of that book that I'm writing. I wanted to bring up just cause I, I thought it was a cool sub story that tied into yours. Um, that, that's in the black punk now, but uh, the sister girl riot. Oh, sure. So there was a moment in New York where uh, many of the people who are in the film, Tamar Kali, the one with, who shaves her head, Honey Child, she's the one who had like a blue Afro and said she might shave it off and whatever. Um, there was a woman, Maya, who was right next to her and this other woman, Sim Simi. So the four of them, are all in bands. They are the leader of the band. They write the music. In most of the cases, the name of the band is their name. And they did a series of events they called the Sister Girl Riots, which were basically the four of them performing and really kind of putting a spotlight on Black female musicianship. You know, and I think just in the name also giving a critique of the like whiteness of riot girl, you know, uh -huh. uh, a critique that most old riot girls are um, very familiar with and, uh, you know, have, I think, tried to reconcile uh, ever since. But um, yeah, so they did, they did a bunch of those and it's kind of taken on a bit of a, you know, a lore that a lot of people still talk about. Yeah, it's just like a magic moment in time. Yeah, it's, where you know, it's like, like, I don't know, like No Wave or something, just like that thing that happened in New York that people talk about, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud to be part of the last one, which was part of the first Afropunk Fest, and uh, Kimya Dawson was also part of that um, on that show. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, when she was still living out that way. Yeah. Word. Another another little connection here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, does anyone here have any specific questions for Mr. Spooner? What's your name, friend? Uh, I'm Dean. Okay. Uh, so I've been home for a very long time. Indigenous, it's kind of, I don't have a choice. <laughs> um, but like being punk is all about rebelling. Um, what are some of the like small acts of rebellion you do to just make it, uh, allow yourself to live comfortably, like live the person you want to be? Mm, that's a good question. Small acts of rebellion. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm just going to start talking and maybe something will come out. Like, I mean, I, I've maintained the politics that I grew up with. You know, I'm still vegan. I have two daughters that I like raised to be part of, uh, not necessarily part. I'm mean, I going to force the music on them. Uh, one has discovered it and the other one is nine. So she still likes Beyonce, but um, like it's, you know, giving them the tools and encouraging them like to find their own voice. I mean, I feel like I live fairly uncompromised. Um, you know, for me, becoming a tattoo artist was 
was liberating because it was the first time that I was able to make money, but also like I'm just drawing on people. So I don't feel like I'm aren't doing harm, you know. I mean, granted, I'm hurting people as I do it, but <laughs> that's their choice. Um, you know, and even with that, like I was the first vegan tattoo artist in uh, California, you know. So I have kind of brought, like I introduced that to Los Angeles, you know. So I don't know. I'm sure I could come up with better things, but, you know, I still turn my stamp, my American flag stamps upside down. Yeah. <laughs> that that's very small. So that's what you're to with it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, somebody else, yeah, please. All right, and your name? Uh, Jude. Jude. My name is Jude. Um, in your book, The High Desert, you know, you grew up desert area. You had like one other friend, right? I I, I mean, mean, there, there was, was a, there was a circle, circle of friends, but there was one yeah, the black kid. Well, yeah, I kind of had a similar experience. I grew up in uh, Chelan, which is like high desert, Washington. Oh, sure. White people everywhere. Only like two black people in that entire small town. And um, I kind of had a friend like that that, you know, introduced me to punk. And it was just the two of us, you know, there only punk kids there. Um, what happened to your other friend? Like, where are you still in touch with them? Like, what do you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Good question. So, like I said earlier. The kids, when, you, when you're different and you're there, uh, it's best to get out. And the kids who left turned out pretty good. The kids who stayed got into drugs. They uh, got into, you know, they got pregnant right after high school. All the kids I knew in high school who stayed, almost all of them had serious drug problems or have them still. You know, there's nothing going on, so... You know, why not do math? You know, it's unfortunate. One thing about the book is that it's like, it's small town USA. So, you know, it can really be anywhere in the United States that's not like the cities. And, you know, if you're a weirdo by, you know, in any, however you define that, like, that's just not a place to be, you know? And there's a lot of pain that comes along with that. Um, you know, you couple that with poverty and what, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a bad recipe. So, uh, yeah, not very many of them fared well. Do we have any more from the audience? Kelsey? Uh, I was curious about, and I, I was trying to remember her name, the, the girl in the movie that was making the calendar. Yeah. Malika. Yeah. Where, where's Mariko now? That's, That's a good question. question. Um, I think that it's fair to say that she wasn't thrilled about her, the way she saw, she ended up seeing herself, you know? I ran into her once or twice um, after the film came out and it was real, like, awkward. I looked her up, you know, on Facebook or whatever. She's like, she still seems like she's somehow involved in, like, event promotion. Um she looked happy in the pictures. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't have like a, a, she's one person that I haven't stayed in touch with, you know? And uh, she is somebody who I always will defend, you know? If you read my book, I think that you'll see that um, in a lot of ways I was like her when I was uh, 14 and, you know, living amongst all these white kids. Uh, it's just like this desire to make your life make sense in their world, you know, the thing that's most comfortable to uh, white people, if if I say to white people, race doesn't matter, that's like, whew, I don't have to think about it then, you know. And I think that the punk scene of the '80s and '90s was very uh, like the people of color within it didn't typically make that their focus which made it comfortable for the majority of the people involved, you know? So I knew that I was looking for her when I was making the film. I was, I knew that she would exist or, I, you know, I didn't know if it would be, I don't know the gender of the person, but I knew that this person would exist. Um, and I wanted to represent that aspect of the scene 
Um, and that aspect of like the experience more as a better word. So, um, you know, so I always defend her. Um, and even while we were making the movie or while I was interviewing her, I would like totally break the, like the interview rules and like turn off the camera and be like, are you sure you want to be saying this? <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, you know, so I did the best to, to, to give an honest portrayal, um, even though it, there's a lot of cringy parts, a lot of cringy things. And I, I, I hope that seeing herself as like, oh, like, I hope this is worth, you know. She seemed like she was struggling. Yeah. And she seemed like that was kind of a self-preservation technique that she was using. To yeah. just kind of like exist in the world. And yeah, the, I was the, very intrigued by her. So Yeah, the, I mean, the, the ending that I put together for her, I really wanted you to hear the, her own conflict. You know, like I could have, I could have made any ending for like, you know, I could have chose something else. Uh, you know, two, two hour interviews, there's a lot of different things, directions to go. But what I wanted is for you to hear that she was confused, you know, um, and she was admitting that to herself, but she was also like, you know, but I'm also making this shirt, you know, or whatever. And it's like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, you did a good job. Thank you. Stuff. The brother in the back. Uh, what's your name? Carl. Carl. Mm -hmm. Great film. It was the first time seeing it. Uh, I do have a question. If you were to do Afropunk today, 20 years later, given the fact that we have social media and we have access to things that, that probably wasn't prevalent back in 2003, do you think the characters would be espousing the same things that they did in this film or would be slightly different? The difference is that um, right off the top, I can tell you um, there would be a lot younger people. I would have I think the youngest person was 15, but there wasn't a lot of teenagers. Um, and that was simply because uh, of who had access to the internet in, in 2001, you know? So I think that it would be, I, I would be able to get a more representation, you know? Uh, I did my best at the time to represent uh, women, men, queer. Um, I'm sure that there would probably be uh, more intersectional conversation around gender or whatever, you know, like, I feel like that's a topic that wasn't really, you know, we were, we were able to be a little bit more focused. Um, and I think, I don't think that's a good thing, but it's just, you know, how we, how we talked about issues back then. Um, and then also, like I said, in the eighties and nineties, the scene, I feel like the black members of bands were kind of like, I'm here, but, like, you don't have to, like, I'm not here, like, the person in the, I'm black, I'm here, I'm black, but I'm not here to be black, right? Um, now I think there's a whole wave of, like, I'm here and I'm black, fuck you, you know? Um, and some of the biggest fans in the scene, and maybe I'm biased, but, like, maybe you can back me up, like, uh, there's a band called Zulu that's, like, huge in the scene, all black. They have a t-shirt that says abolish white hardcore. And they're like uncompromised. Like they, if you see their videos and you didn't have the music, you would maybe just think it was like, they were like backpack hip hop kids or something, you know, but they're like the heaviest hardcore band, you know, um, soul blow is another one that's super huge. And, uh, you know, everyone in the band is black except for the drummer. There's no band on earth that sounds like them. They're doing like, bringing a whole new thing to it. So I think that there'd be an element of empowerment that I have to highlight. It feels like this film, I feel like it ends with like hope, you know, but it's like, like hope, you know? And I think now it's like, fuck yeah, we're doing it. You know, and it feels like when I look at my, my Instagram feed and granted we all curate our own feeds, but I look at mine and I'm like, damn, it's hella black and brown. You know, like the, the punk scene is super queer. Like it feels like I can completely comfortably exist with amazing bands and not have to listen to a single white guy. 
you know? Um, and that's like, you know, not that I have anything against white guys, but like, I've heard everything that they have to say, you know? Like, and that's the same for television or whatever. It's like, how are you going to tell me a new story, you know? But like, a queer story, a Pakistani story, like, you know, a, 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 just a, a story from a cisgendered woman. Like, it's just like, these are not stories we hear enough and we're, and we are seeing them in the punk and art we're seeing now, you know? It's not like uh, the, the days of Riot Girl Bikini Kill where people are like, you know, threatening women on stage for just existing. You know, I'm sure that happens, but like those women paved the way so that these women today can just like kick ass, you know? And uh, so that really excites me and I would definitely have to highlight that, you know? Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. I know Fishbone was big for you. Angela made a couple cameos in that movie. Did you? Yeah, it's funny because, uh, you know, if you... The, uh, the vocalist for Fishbone. Yeah, if you look at, uh, he actually only has one part, and it's just him saying, look at Bad Brains. Right, <laughs> right. And it's like, that was for a couple reasons. One was because uh, when I interviewed them, it was one of my first interviews, and it was in the back of the Wetlands, which is Spark, uh, in New York. And they have, uh, we were in their like, green room or whatever, and they had like a refrigerator back there that was just like, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it was impossible to get clean audio because I'm just using yeah. like a boom mic or whatever. Um, but I kind of love it because I made a promise to myself when I was editing that I was not going to give preference to people because they're like big or they're rock stars More or whatever. established. Yeah, like I put their name on the cover because that like will help sell the, the, the DVD or whatever. But like the people who speak the most are not necessarily people who are in bands that are that popular. Yeah. More like and regional stuff. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I was just like, I'm only like, if you said it and it's, you said it right, I'm putting it in. So yeah, I kind of love that. Like one of the more famous people is only gets one little just moment. A few seconds. Yeah. yeah. Um, that felt like punker. To me, yeah. yeah, I was I was wondering the uh, intent or reason behind that. Yeah, I mean, it was, it you know, it? if I didn't have that shitty audio, I'm sure he, you know, he said great things, you know. Yeah, but uh, it was what it was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that clears that up. <laughs> what are you? What's giving you hope, or what's uh, giving you concern today? I think what I just said about like you know when I talked about hope, you know, if we're talking about this. Uh, this community and where we are today, you know, I, 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 I've always seen punk as like a smaller version or like, you know, one corner of the underground and the underground is a reflection of the mainstream, you know, like the mainstream is always trying to catch up. The things that we were talking about in the nineties are now being talked about in the mainstream, you know? So I mean, not even to toot my own horn, but I, I found the zine that I wrote in high school and I'm and in it, I'm talking about the difference between sex and gender, you know? Wow. And yeah. I remember reading, I just, I just read it like a month ago and I was like, wow, like this is advanced. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. For the nineties, especially. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I still have a hard time explaining that to normies now, you know? <laughs> uh-huh. So it's, it's a cycle and, and the, the mainstream is always trying to, to catch up to the underground. And I think the underground is really exciting to me right now, you know? Yeah. So my hope is that the mainstream is going to catch up. And by that point, we will be on to even more progressive things. And, uh, and it's just that cycle will continue, you know, and hopefully we do it before, uh, you know, while we still have a chance to live on this planet, you know, that would be ideal. Ideal. Yeah. Especially yeah. for those of us who have, those of us who have kids, you know? Yeah. You know, I want to leave you guys with hope because I do have hope when I look at what the kids are doing, you know? Yeah. 
So you're going back to Los Angeles tomorrow? First thing. Yeah. Came up just for you guys. That's <laughs> so sweet. Well, I really appreciate you coming down. Well, we love you. We appreciate you. Give it up for Mr. Spooner. Thanks. Thanks again, James Spooner. His latest book is called Black Punk Now. It's an anthology from many different writers writing about the black punk experience. He's also got a graphic novel called The High Desert, and you can find his film Afropunk online. This episode was recorded by Andrew Ebright at the Capitol Theater in downtown Olympia. The next episode of Low Profile features Laura Logic from the X-Ray Specs and Essential Logic. Hope to catch you next time.